Hello, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, deadlock avoidance on futures. Um, and this is a work that has both a, a practical component, which is this deadlock avoidance uh, policy that talks about why tasks shouldn't wait for strangers. And we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but on the other hand, it also has a more theoretical component that establishes a root cause uh, from data races to uh, deadlock futures. Um, so first, just for those of you who don't know what futures are, you can think of them as just a, a fork join uh, model uh, extended with data. So you have uh, a primitive fork that is able to create a new logical task, and then you have uh, a join primitive that given two uh, logical tasks, you merge them into one. And the data component here is representing some data dependency, OK? But we'll get more in, into more detail in a few uh, slides. So the importance of futures is its really widespread use in programming languages. So you see um, them, you can categorize their usage in two use cases. You'll have um, essentially asynchronous programming, where you're trying to, uh, while well, you're using futures to model uh, callbacks or events. Um, and these you can, you have even some syntax uh, for it that was uh, introduced by the .NET actually. But there is support for Python and JavaScript and Rust, all of these, they have these async await uh, keywords that help uh, use futures. Uh, and then you have this category of, of programs uh, for test parallel programming which in this paper is more of where, where our practical focus is, it is, although the model is general and supports both. Uh, and for task uh, parallel programming, you have, well, first you have futures uh, support for that in the languages, but you also have these high performance uh, computing libraries such as COCOS or uh, Intel TBB uh, that are specifically suited for these kind of irregular uh, parallel programs um, where you describe your dependent data dependencies and explicit parallelism. So in the end, what you have when you're writing these parallel programs is the, the, these, uh, this graph of tasks and, and data. So it's kind of like a data flow feel uh, when you're programming, um, where the execution, uh, where, where you're making explicit both the parallel execution and the data dependencies, okay? Um, so in these parallel programs, it's, um, it's possible to have, you know, like matrices or arrays of, of futures. And then in this situation, the problem is that, well, uh, off by one error, will introduce a cycle in your, in your graph of tasks, and that introduces a deadlock, okay? But our intuition was that actually the root cause of these uh, cycles is a data race. So the only, if you only have a program that only uses futures, the only way to create a deadlock is uh, by creating a data race. Okay, so this was belief or folklore if you want, and we wanted to know if this was exactly true, so this was our motivation. But more, more than that, we also wanted to know if we could use this understanding to verify and debug parallel programs. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be introducing you just an example of future so you get a bit of a taste of how it looks like and a deadlock. Um, and then I'm going to talk first about the practical um, contribution that we have, which is this uh, policy on using futures. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about not about how we got to the result, but the underlying model that we used uh, to, to get to the result. And finally, I'm going to talk a bit about future work uh, and conclude. So um, as I said before, futures is based on this model of fork join. And you have a primitive here calling it async that uh, expects a function okay, that just returns a value. And what this is doing in terms of parallel control is just creating a new parallel task that will be running this function and then at some point will produce this value. And then you use the other X primitive called get to retrieve the value. And once you do that, the caller gets blocked until the parallel task that is producing the value terminates. And 
Okay, and so get can actually be executed by multiple tasks at the same time and multiple times by the same task. So as for an example of a, of a deadlock, uh, one that is very simple and that has a cycle of two nodes or two tasks is actually you create two tasks. Um, uh, so here in this program you have a parent task that has two shared variables, x and y. It spawns a future uh, and assigns a task A to a shared variable x, does the same, spawns task B and assigns it to, task, to shared variable y, and then the task A is waiting for some task that is on y, and task B is waiting for some task that is uh, on uh, x. And then the problem here is that you actually have a data race, so you'll have non-determinism. So you have two traces. Let's look at these. So the first trace is actually not very interesting. Um, there's no deadlock, there's just, uh, what happens is that task A does not observe the right of the parent task, so therefore once it reads the shared variable, it reads null. So it just throws a null pointer exception. Let's look at the second trace, the, the one that is interesting for the sake of this talk. Uh, and here the task A actually observes the right of the parent task, in which case you have task A awaiting for the termination of task B task B awaiting for the termination of task A, therefore a deadlock. Um, so this is the running example we're gonna be using. Um, and what we did in the end, we wanted to prove uh, that data race freedom implies deadlock freedom, and the way we achieved that this was by creating, sorry, a policy that deadlock freedom implies this policy, and that the policy enjoys deadlock freedom, okay? So now we're gonna talk about uh, this part of the right-hand side of the implication. So this is an overview of how the verification algorithm works. And essentially what we're doing is just monitoring um, the get and the async. And what we have, we just have some verification state, which is the set of tasks that you are, that a task is able to wait for. So these are the known tasks, okay? Remember, don't wait for strangers. Uh, so the only way to extend this set is either by creating a task, in which case you put that name in, the, in your set, or when you're waiting for a termination of the task, you inherit the knowledge of the task that you waited for. And before you do a get, of course, you have this check, ensure that the, the task is known is in the set. So just as a, to go back to our running example, you have that first your parent program starts with an empty knowledge, then it spawns a task, it knows A, then it spawns another task, it knows B. Note that task A does not know of any other task once it starts because it inherits the knowledge of the parent. And when it's trying to do waiting for task B, it's not in its knowledge, which is empty, therefore there's an error, okay? Um, so what we did was we took this algorithm and we implemented it in a parallel programming library for Java 8. And the interesting thing about this library is that it already includes a deadlock-free subset of the API. So it already has some, some construct like isolated, which is deadlock-free mutual exclusion, and phasers that you're able to write, you know, like very synchronization. Um, and this is all that free. And our uh, policy actually works when combined with these, uh, all of these um, constructs. So you, you kind of extend the deadlock free API subset with futures. Um, so then what we did was we took this uh, tool and we evaluated it in two ways. The first uh, was we took a, um, just a set, a big data set of homework assignments and this is for a class that, uh, of undergraduate uh, studies uh, where people were learning to program with futures. Um, and in this case, these are all parallel programming applications that are kind of compute bound. So here you have the problem of you don't, you're, you will really want your homework to finish before the deadline and you don't want to be waiting uh, undeterminately for a deadlock. Uh, we actually were able to find a deadlock and this deadlock, the kind of error that existed was an off by one error, like I said before. So it was a plus one that someone forgot to put and that created a data race that then cause the deadlock. Uh, we also uh, looked at five different benchmarks that 
uh, really pushed the envelope on uh, the, the number of tests they were spawning and the kind of synchronization graphs that they were producing, okay? Um, so these are all uh, applications with tens of thousands of tasks being spawned. Uh, and there's even one series that has a million tasks running in par concurrently. Um, so then um, we did two kinds of evaluation, just measuring the time overhead and the memory overhead. Uh, in terms of time, our tool, sorry, uh, showed always an overhead of at most 7%, so it was pretty uh, reasonable. And in terms of memory, it behaved, it had a factor of around 30%, except for the application with a million tests, and for that it was 2.3 uh, factor. Um, so now let's look at the data race freedom implies uh, our policy uh, part of the, of the, of the work. Um, and for this, what we used was we just use uh, the same theory that is used for data race detection. So we use the happens before relation, which is a partial order that you can represent as a DAG. And this is an example of a DAG. Actually, this is the example of our, this is our running example. Um, and here the, the nodes represent instruction instances, so steps of the execution of your program. And the operations of interest were well, memory operations and synchronization operations. So whenever, so the, the first blue edges are memory operations, so there's just sequence. You only have from one task to the other. And then you have async. In this case, you don't have gets because the program is deadlocked. But in the paper, you can see examples with that. Um, and then what the, the relation that happens before relation is just if two nodes are connected, the first happens before the other. Um, and then what we did was we extended the computation graph, which is what I just described, and we added some information about, well, the, the known set. So at each node, what tasks does it know? And also uh, we, we annotated the kind of uh, memory values that were being communicated through uh, memory operations. So whenever you create a memory location, you add that name the memory location to your uh, local memory, and whenever you read a value, you put that name as well in that set, okay? And then uh, the kind of, the way we went around and proved this was essentially by looking at how values and names uh, flow in the graph, okay? Uh, this is more or less the intuition throughout the whole uh, proof uh, strategy. So for example, this is one of the lemmas that we showed. We showed that the, in a computation graph, the knowledge uh, flows with a happens before relationship. So if you have a node, so in that case, for example, V4, um, V4 is the node that happens exactly after spawning a task A. And because V4 knows A, then any node that is connected to it also knows A. Another result that we uh, showed that is important for, to prove the main results of our work is that, um, well, knowledge must contain all tasks in the memory, okay? Uh, and, but that only is true for data race free graphs. But as we know, this example is, well, it is racy. So actually it fails because knowledge does not know of age and age is a test name. Um, so all of this work, the theoretical work was uh, proved using the cock proof assistant and the proofs are online and available for you to download as well as is the code of uh, the known, joint, known joints policy. Uh, and we show that known joins, um, uh, well, from known joins you get deadlock freedom and that data race freedom implies known joins. There's also a result I wanted to highlight, which is we, because we were using computation graphs and this happens before relation, uh, one interesting result in my point of view that we proved was that you could reinterpret this result, uh, the known joins policy as a happens before relation on nodes. And this is interesting because you can use uh, vector clocks from race detection in any other uh, data structure that is able to help you with causality. And you can use all this knowledge and put it in this context. It also gives you a kind of a bound of how far we can go. Um, in our experience, we actually ended up developing uh, uh, another data structure for this kind of purpose. And our experience tells us that vector clocks were better in terms of speed, but worse in terms of memory. Um, so in conclusion, what I talked about today was 
essentially there was this uh, theoretical component where we introduce uh, a theory on shared memory and, and futures, and we talked a bit about uh, the relationship between data race freedom and deadlock freedom in the context of futures. I also showed you a tool that has an overhead of around 6% or 7% on programs up to a million tasks. And for future work, uh, we're definitely looking at a bit more general constructs like promises. And promises are interesting because they kind of generalize futures and they decouple the task ex execution from the synchronization. And it's essentially like a rendezvous variable. But the problem, the, the challenge here for verification is that there's not enough uh, information to be able to know if there's a deadlock. So there's some information missing there and that's kind of a challenge. Uh, the other thing that we're interested in is un understanding uh, or proving uh, some properties like how data, sorry, how data race freedom uh, influences uh, determinism in computation graphs. Um, that's it. I'm, thank you and I want to hear some questions if you have it.